Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of The Roundtable with Full Frame Kicks. Uh, tonight we have a very special guest with us, um, Mr. Alex Dima. Hello, Alex. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for on. having me, guys. Thanks for having me. Um, as always, I've got my co-host with me, Andy. Say hello. Hello, I'm Andy Wilson, the sneaker dog, the sneakonomist, and uh, generally a good guy. And Josh. Hello, I'm Josh, also known as the Lucky Butter. I am both the villain and the Robin Hood of the reselling community. You're not allowed to say Robin Hood at the moment. Oh, all right, pra- yeah, the game stop stuff. <laughs> yeah. He's been practicing his lines. <laughs> um, we are unfortunately without our other co-host, Leon. He is up to some other stuff, so he will be back, please God, with us next week. So we're going to crack on. So tonight's episode of the Roundtable Discussion is all about collaborations collaborations within the sneaker industry and the streetwear industry, which obviously all marries together because that's kind of what it's all about. Um, I want to start off with you, Josh. Uh, I want you to show me a sneaker that means something to you with the collab, why you like that collab, et cetera, et cetera, and how the um, collabs make a difference uh, each week with botting. So, you know, Supreme, for example, if they've got a collab one week and next week they don't, does it make a difference with the bot market? Um, you know, sneakers as well. You know, when you see a collab, is that going to make things different? So can you give us your take on it, please? Yeah, absolutely. I was actually going to put either the Travis Dunks or the Stussies because I know Stussy has been coming out with some bangers of collabs this year, like the Air Force Ones, etc. Now, I've, I've been told today as it goes that they're bringing out Harachis and I can't wait for that because that brings me back a bit. But yeah, I like that. Yeah, it's decent. But I am a reseller, so I needed to basically support a fellow reseller of this year's collab. And that was basically the Sean Weatherspoon uh, ASICs. Now, I could have come with the Air Maxes, but um, I'm not going to say I sold them, but they're no longer in my possession. Um, But as as soon as I saw Sean Weatherspoon, for those that don't know, Sean Weatherspoon is basically a reseller. He owns the company Round 2 out in L.A., uh, and I think they've got other loads of other different sites now anyway. But yeah. basically, it's a consignment shop, right? He's a reseller. That's what he does. I just love the fact that not only Adidas, not only Nike, but also Asics, I've paid homage to a reseller. I mean, that's like, to people that say that brands hate reselling and botting, it's a big F you. Because literally, he's got, he's done it. He's gone out and actually collaborated with the brands and that's all he's known for, if that makes sense. Now, the reason why I really like these is the out there presence of them, like two different shoes, basically. Also, the As- Asics gel lights. I mean, if you're an old school sneakerhead, you've got to love them. You've got to understand that there's no tongue in there. So a shoe without a tongue makes no sense, but still. And they're so comfortable as well. And the fact that they're all corduroy, I absolutely love. So they, they were like the ones that this year, I'll be honest, I, I never, ever get nervous about botting. I never really like get emotional on it. So if I don't hit, I don't hit. If I hit, I hit. I, I just think about his inventory coming in and out. That was the only release this year where I was actually nervous and I was actually not shaking, but I was kind of railed up about it and I was really hoping I hit. And I did. And I kept them as a personal pair. I got two pairs. I've got those and I've actually still got the other one in a box up there in case those ones get mashed. But anyway, that, nice. was, that was the the collab I thought I would go with because I'm a reseller. So I have to... Good choice. Resellers, yeah, yeah. And for those that don't know, actually, I don't know if I've got enough time, but I'm going to do it anyway. So this shoe was meant to represent LA at, um, at sun, uh, Sunrise. So this was actually the round two shoe, hence the vibrant colors. And it was actually a collaboration, not just with Asics, but with Atmos in Japan as well. And then this was m- meant to represent Atmos. So you've got all the different, you get like these different tab tags, sorry, that you can put on saying Atmos. And then you've got the other ones that's a Sean Witherspoon stuff. But yeah, yeah there's loads of them. They all pull off, don't they? Yeah, that's right. I think I've got, I mean, they should all be in the box. Uh, yeah, so there's like, one of them, for instance, you can just stick them on. And an all corduroy shoe, I'm a, I'm a sucker for corduroy. But yeah, I think um, with collaborations, first of all, on streetwear side of things, there's a couple of collaborations every year that no matter what, when Supreme drops, bot prices will increase just before. So if you wanted to buy a bot currently, it'd be very hard for you to buy a bot on the retail market. In other words, some of these bots cost £150. You'd be very, very lucky, luckier than getting shoes if you're able to get a bot for retail. Now, if we look at the Supreme only bots at the time was Mech, Prime and Velox, you can probably get them off season for a few hundred pounds. As soon as they announce, I don't know, the North Face collaboration. Yeah. In that one, 
When there was always a big collab every year with them, isn't it? They're very famous for the North Face collab. Yeah, I mean, they dropped the ball, I think, in the last couple, like with the big S. And then before that, they dropped like these jackets in the summer. It made no sense. Yeah, it hasn't been as great over the last couple of years, agreed. No, but, but still the prices, just because people assume that something big is going to drop, it just increases the bot value straight away. And also it, it brings the hype back to the brand in my eyes. Like Supreme for a reseller is on the downward trend. Like box logos, whatever, are not as once lucrative as they, as they once were. Supreme is not that lucrative anymore. But like that, that machine there, the, the Mortal Kombat machine, for instance, I mean, that this year for resale, you'll be lucky to get a thousand pound. Retail's about 700. Whereas if that would have dropped maybe two years ago, you're easily yeah. getting three, four thousand pounds. Look at like the pinball and stuff. I mean, you can't necessarily compare it because this is a one-up machine. So it's not, you know, it's not like the best <laughs> qualities, but even the BMX, the BMX tanks as well. And Supreme should be known for the BMX. The BMX is a, is a very iconic piece for Supreme. That's where they came from. But, um, yeah, it, it does. It plays a massive part. And not only that, with, the shoe, with shoes as well, like the off-white, as soon as Off-White announced that they're bringing the 20 out or they're bringing more uh, of the, um, the, I think it's the Jordan 4 breads that are coming out. Is that right? Yeah, there's a few things speculated, isn't there, guys? But there's nothing really confirmed. No, not yet. But as soon as they did, there's one bot in particular called Mbot. It's actually a mobile bot that I've got. Um, in particular, that, that the price just went straight up. You would have been able wow. to buy it on the secondary market for about £2,000. Now you'll be lucky to find it for three and a half, four thousand pounds just from the announcement and a picture of promised shoes from Off White and Virgil. So it is, it's a big one. And in all honesty, it's where we throw all of our resources at. Like I'll, I'll pay a lot of money for proxies, for a server to deploy that. And that's where we're trying to get as many pairs as possible. But little do people realize that actually, us botters, we'd be lucky to get one pair on those sort of drops as well. So, but it is, it's, it is a big thing for us. It's an exciting time for us because of resale, etc. But yeah, it will. It will boost the price up, not only of the resale of the pairs, but also the bot as well. Well, I was going to say, because obviously, especially with the collabs like that, the hype, hype releases, um, they're not really a uh, general release, are they? So it's all raffle. So I can imagine it's much even harder to bot it, right? Yeah, there are a few. There are still some low key-ish sites that will still drop first come, first serve because they like yeah. the hype and the traffic going towards the company, especially Off-White. And the thing is with Off-White, the way in which they, they make their releases, it's impossible for you guys as manual users to hit an Off-White drop on the Off-White website. The reason being is because they've got two things that they do. One is a region lock. So what they do every couple of minutes, they'll rotate what region is allowed to check out. Like last time it went from Singapore to Japan then Bangladesh to India, then to Portugal, Brazil. So we've got stuff that detects the queue. We know we've got monitors that tells us what's getting let in. So then we just adapt, put our IPs in from Portugal and start checking out to an England, an England address. But let's say you did, let's say for some reason it was England, which is hardly ever, but let's say it was the UK they were allowing you to check out on. They then did that stupid thing of an SMS or authentication. <laughs> That SMS authentication didn't work. Why? Because the servers were crashing because there was too many SMSs coming in, too many requests. So the website deemed it as a DDoS attack, the, the, the actual website that were doing the SMS because it's not theirs. They're just renting an API. Whereas we had our bots that were bypassing that anyway. We're going straight to checkout. We didn't need to see that page because if you understand it, all well, the endpoint is something different. So <clears throat> we can car and go straight to checkout. And if we look at the, it was the Jordan 5s, the last one, the sales, wasn't it? Jordan 5s. Yeah, M me and I bought together. The fours. Uh, was it the fours or fives? I thought it was the no, it's five sale fives. It was the sorry, fives. it was the fives. My apologies. And then, no, but it was the fours before that. I think it's all yeah. yeah, and they got the same name as the colorway. But if we look at that between me and three other guys that we bought together in a group, we had together over two hundred pairs, like botted, done, and delivered to us. So even though the websites are starting to do a lot more raffles, well, first and foremost, I've got raffle bots that enter 10,000 of my emails, like DSM, if they drop, I know I'm hitting no matter what, because of the way the API works with the raffle bot. So even then we will still bot raffles and we'll still get in like hundreds, thousands, even some tens of thousands of entries. So it, even though it is a bit of an ask for us with raffles, we'll find a way and we'll always adapt to that anyway. So the SMS, authentic or the SMS authentication meant for individuals, it was another hurdle Whereas for the botters, they were bypassing it anyway. 
So what's exactly. really I'll, I'll get the there's a there's a developer out there and what he did was he wrote a whole article based on it and the reason why bots were able to check out and humans weren't and he he lays it out step by step in regards to the steps the bots took and why humans weren't able to check out so i'll get, I'll get the the link to that article because it's a very interesting read but a lot of websites even things like hate H capture um even things like where they're asking questions on shopify bots are getting through that because we have uh solving services auto solve it's called we don't need to solve captures anymore you do we don't we don't touch it we just sit back and the bot does it so it's it, you know all of these hurdles that people are trying to use we're getting around it anyway through devs and at the end of the day it's all about speed and undetection of speed and we're getting to that point now there are some good websites out there that are stopping that like mesh with their new system called sequence but we're still able to we're still able to get there before humans do because a website gets fried and we don't need the front end web, uh, front end website we go around the back end. Amazing. Well, what you're saying, Josh, is that me sitting there swearing at my screen is not going to do me any favors. I still probably won't cop. <laughs> no, I mean, interestingly, I tell you one yeah. platform currently where you can is Shopify, but unfortunately, UK and Shopify, we hardly get any drops on their kith. Sometimes we'll release in the UK, and some drops like I think the Pata. New Balance with Shopify. So, but if you're looking at like Foot Patrol, if you're looking at when JD released the dunks and stuff, you might get one or two, but by the time you've got one, my bot's checked out like 20 or 30. So it's- For Foot Locker, you're lucky to even get onto the site, aren't you? As soon as you, as soon as you hit that URL, you're just in a waiting room and just, just wait for it to say it's out of stock. You're never even gonna get through to the product page for, in this, my experience. Yeah, this is how I put it with Foot Locker to friends when they go, how come I can't get through? So I'll run, Three major bots when it comes to Foot Locker. I've got Polaris, uh, Cyber's currently killing it, and Moji. Now, these three bots have queue bypasses. that they, they do a stock endpoint or a checkpoint. I run on each bot 5,000 tasks. That's in three bots. That's 15,000 people I have in the queue, basically. But not only in the queue, but bypassing to the front and hammering the site with requests, 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 car in, checking out, car in, checking out on a loop. So it doesn't have to queue at all? No, well, it depends on the proxy. So now you go into the finer details of, there are certain proxies out there which are individual IP addresses. For the 15,000 people in my queue, I need different IP addresses because otherwise they'll rate limit me. They'll see that all these requests and go, hold on a minute, this isn't right, boom. And they'll ban those IP addresses. But certain proxies are better because they're faster. Not only that, I'll then find a server where the IP address is hosted and I'll put the bot on that server. So it's very fast. Ping time is like, Half a millisecond when your ping times at home are like seven or eight milliseconds. But I'm getting 15,000 people bypassing the queue, getting in front and hammering the site. So when you're sitting there doing nothing, from the beginning, I'm getting checkout after checkout after checkout. Like we got, we can hit anywhere between just, four, if I get four pairs on Foot Locker with 15,000 people, I'm actually happy. But sometimes you can get hundreds of checkouts, depending on the region I bought, because it won't be UK only. I'll also bought Poland, Czech. Then there's new regions, there's old region websites. Germany's moved to the new region, so I'll now bot Germany. There's, it all becomes a faff, but the, the whole long and short of that is if you're a manual user, don't even bother with Foot Locker. And so without without wanting to spend too much time on botting. Yeah, uh, I was gonna say. Sorry, really yeah, ones. sorry. <laughs> I, can I just, what you, just a very, very quick answer. Um, are the people developing the bots um, moving things on so quickly that the brands and the retailers can't stop them? Or do the, the retailers not cut, just think it's just a waste of our resource, so we might as well just let it happen? To be fair, Akamai and people like that are trying to stop them, but bot developers are basically reverse engineers and they'll do it the night before, usually push an update and they go, right, we found it, bang, let's do it. That's their full job. A lot of them actually work in artificial intelligence. So some of them have AI modules that detect it anyway and do it for them and learn what Foot is doing. And even midway into a drop, an hour in, right, we've pushed an update, we found what they're doing, bang, go into it. And then that's what we've done. Amazing. Thanks, Josh. Um, so basically what you're saying is, is it does make a massive difference um, with collaborations. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Love it. Um, Andy, Alex, what's your thought on the collaborations? How have you seen things in the last, you know, say three to five years? I, but look, for me, collaborations have been around for years with companies, but I feel like in the last four or five years, I feel like it's just mental. Everybody is collabing, left, right and centre. And that's where I... For me, it boils down to 
how much effort goes into that collab. So I watched the last episode in terms of marketing. And I found that really, really interesting. I thought that was a great episode. Um, and sometimes I think some of the things that I've seen probably more recently, I've seen some, in my opinion, some pretty lazy collabs. Um, yeah. So but a prime example for me, and, and it's probably quite a contentious um, one to call out, is the, the J3 fragment. I, I, I thought there was so much more that could have been done with that shoe. Other than the heel, it looked really great. The rest of it was just... An a totally agree, Andy, totally agree. And and I just think, you know, it, ones like that, as an example to me, are it's a, it's a missed opportunity. Um, so yeah. I think if you can collab with, particularly if it's a design house, if you can collab with a designer that is going to make enough difference to that shoe to make it unique as a collab, rather than well, let's just do a different colour. Um, then I think it's always a positive piece in terms of a collaboration. My concern is when it's just, look, essentially, let's push out a white shoe and let's put a logo on it. But that's that's not ideal for me. I'll probably be proved wrong because there will probably be a pair coming up in six months. I'll be like, oh, look, they're really plain, but I love them. Can I have them, please? But I, but I, mean, I found that the, I personally, and this is really contentious, you thought yours was contentious, um, I found the Jordan 4 sales to me, I mean, I've never had them in hand. I've not studied them, but to me, it was a lazy collaboration. Sorry, no, but I, I love that shoe. <laughs> but tell it me, it's a beautiful shoe. I've got it there. I'm honestly in right. hand. Yeah. it is unbelievable. So my caveat is, I haven't had them in hand. But if, right. but just from the pictures, and I've not studied them perfectly. To me, it just it looks a little it looks a little bit lazy. Well, I'll post them to you. I'm going to post them to you. Oh, what, physically? Uh, yeah. you send them? I'll physically send them, but I need them back, though. I've only got one. <laughs> but, yeah, you can, you can have them in hand and see what you think. I'll send them to you. Andy Lowe, um, I don't think I properly held a pair either. So, Josh, you can send me the other size. The other side, left foot, right foot. Yeah, but no, I, 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 I want to be clear that I'm not sending anybody my pair. <laughs> <laughs> can I say, though, a, a lazy collaboration that I thought, which was a massive afterthought. I can't even remember the model, but you know when Union came out with the Jordan 4 Guavas and the Noirs. Yes. What was the other Jordan pair they came out the with? Delta. The Delta. It just seemed like a consolidation prize. And even the owner of Union, when he was on every podcast, Full Size Run, whoever it was, all he spoke about was the inspiration of the Jordan 4, disregarded the other pair when actually what they could have done was hyped up a whole new model in the realms of like coming up, up and coming. But they just focused massively on the Jordan 4. The rest of the other pairs that came out, because there was a few, that literally like was never even spoken about. We didn't even touch because they were just pointless. Yeah. That's interesting you should say that. I kind of feel like that's a bit what's happening at the moment. I feel like we kind of uh, hit the peak and we're going downwards now where, like you said, they're coming out with the collabs, but they, they're bringing out a secondary model. It was a bit like when they did the uh, Paris, uh, London, and what was it, Milan, was it? Yeah, Milan. And look what they gave London. Like, what was that Jordan they gave London? Do you remember? Yeah. We got and it was like, yeah. yeah. And it was like, I just feel like, what are you doing? Like, I don't understand who's behind the design team and the thought I'll tell you, mate, that's, that's what happens with Brexit. That's, that's why they gave us that one. Like, and then Alex look at, London. totally. And also, I kind of feel a bit like Sakai. Like, I love Sakai, but I feel like it's now how many they're going to bring out. They're going to bring out like 10 every year now. It's, it's like, really you know. Yeah. See, I love that shoe. I've got the black. I've actually got all pairs, but um, I felt like the nylon was a bit of uh, like just a lazy version of the waffles yeah. as well. Like they just an afterthought. Yeah. I think they should have stuck with the fuchsia and the black and white. The new Sakai is what they called the vapor the waffles. Vapor waffles. Yes. I think they should have stuck Horrible with that. Shoe. Yeah. So I love the shoe, but I like. Oh. Yeah, but I like stupid shoes. I wear odd shoes on Asics. So. Um, I, I just don't get why they're now bringing out all these colorways. However, the, they've got a tan one with a blue tick coming. I'm 100% getting them. <laughs> so, uh, so for my, my if, I, if I can just jump in with some thoughts then on, on collaborations and, and why I think there's been such a, a, a big push and increase. If, yeah, please do, Andrew. If, if you think about the, uh, the onset of athleisure, dress down the whole, uh, that side of the business has been growing over the years. You know, people don't wear suits to work anymore. Very few people wear suits. Um, you know, we've seen the likes of Dr. Martin's that IPO Tailander last week, the price at the top of its range, and then the shares are up 25% on day one uh, because they've got a real sticky crowd. Um, they do very good collaborations. 
uh, and it suits the dress down culture. So where I'm going with this is collaborations previously would have been with sports stars. Now it's that, that line between luxury and athleisure is being rubbed out or blurred, helped by pop culture. Um, uh, well, yes, but I mean, so I mean, you can you can you can go back to you can go right the way back to Jordan and think when MTV started and rappers Oops. wearing it, and suddenly that's when people started seeing the rappers wearing the shoes, etc. But um, sort of more more recently, if you think about um, you know rappers, music stars, uh, influencers, etc., it's all grown with the onset of social media. Um, and, you know, I just think that that whole culture where we've moved away from people buying trainers to actually do sporting, there was a, yeah. a, a there was a, I'm, I'm trying to remember the number, and I think it's 14% um, of people that were in a recent NPD poll were buying shoes. This was in 2020, were buying trainers or sneakers to actually exercise in. So people are, people are buying them. So... <clears throat> That your influence is that you're wearing these for comfort. Your influence is that you're wearing uh, them when you're going out, when we're allowed to go out. Um, and I guess that's where the term influencer influencer comes from, really. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah. So I think that that that's been the big the the big push is that no longer. This is why I question one of the previous pieces I've done on my um, on my account. Uh, I know why Under Armour gave Steph Curry his own brand because he was threatening to leave. Um, his wife runs a charity foundation and they bolted that onto part of his whole deal that they've given him. But personally, I, I, I might be proved wrong here, but I, I think that's going to absolutely flop personally, um, particularly anywhere outside the US. And uh, I think we were discussing last week how um, basketball shoe culture is very, very different in the US as it is to mm -hmm. here. Really, we just, we, we pick on the on the sort of the OGs, the, the, the original stuff that was, uh, that we're wearing for comfort. Whereas there was a period of time that lots of people in the US playing basketball and, and you know, they were growing up wearing those shoes. So um, yeah, I went off at a bit of a tangent there, but, but ultimately what I'm saying is that the, the, the dress down culture, it suddenly meant that the people that are wearing these shoes, it's no longer looking at David Beckham, Lionel Messi, Ronaldo playing in these football boots. It's the likes of Travis Scott walking up to uh, McDonald's playing his PlayStation and suddenly he's signed three collaborations. Yeah, totally. Totally. Alex, what's your take? Um, well, it's a really good shout that Andy's just said. You know, I, I work in a, well, pre-lockdown pre life. Um, I work in, um, work in banking. I would work in a head office environment. And, you know, for years and years and years, it was suits. You know, that is, you are absolutely expected to wear a suit. And, and that was that. I can't remember even for probably the two, three years prior to working from home the last year, the last time I put a, a shirt and tie on at work. Um, and, and it was lovely. But I think what that then comes to is in that environment, everybody can wear jeans and a hoodie. But if you want to wear jeans and particularly a hoodie or a tee that stands out a little bit, then actually you see people who start wearing, you see off-white t-shirts, you'll see some ovo t-shirts, you'll see Stussy, you'll see Pata, you know, and those are the people that want to stamp that bit of individuality on what they wear at work still, yeah. also while still wearing something that actually is just super comfy. I'm still sitting here in, in essentially just a t-shirt or just a sweater and some jeans. But actually, I'm wearing some really nice kicks because that is who I am. And you know what? If I can throw in a t-shirt that matches that, I'll, I'll have a bit of it. And it's a really good shout because that's exactly what it was like in my office environment. You saw that change coming where yeah. people dress down, started off with, I won't wear a tie. Then I wear a polo shirt, and then before you knew it, it was just hoodies all yeah. the time. But it's a really good shout, Andy. I hadn't even thought of that before, to be honest, mate. But yeah. Hang on, and, I, and, I, and I, I'm exactly the same. That I'm lucky that I mean we have to have a collar on our, so we can we can wear polo shirts. Um, but I wouldn't sit in a hoodie. But I could. I normally just wear a white shirt when I'm in the office. But I can wear trainers, and people. I mean, people laugh at me because they can't understand why. I mean, there's people I work with that don't own one pair of trainers. Um, <laughs> You know, obviously, if they were UK 11, they might be able to borrow some, um, but no, they wouldn't. Um, but uh, but no, I think it's it's interesting. And, and, and on that whole move to dress down culture, it's interesting that uh, 
Mike Ashley has, as, as we all know, owned stakes in lots and lots of different companies, brands. He buys them up. Um, I mean, his most famous and, and the one he made most money on was Adidas back in the day, uh, fairly soon after Sports Direct floated. He bought a stake in Adidas. Adidas shares shot up. Um, and all the shareholders were asking questions. And he said, oh, no, I bought them PA. So they bought them his own money. Uh, so the shareholders all went absolutely ballistic. He sold them at a profit, then bought a stake for Sports Direct, and it actually went down. But um, the most recent stuff he's been buying, um, you know, and he's been buying Mulberry, all these different, you know, Game Group and all these different things. But he's been buying stakes in Hugo Boss. And I think he now owns about 10% of Hugo Boss. Now, for me personally, and I know he's now called Fraser's Group, not Sports Direct, because he bought House of Fraser or he owns House of Fraser and he wants to push himself uh, and he's got the clothing side. So he's got USC, he's got flannels and all this sort of stuff. Uh, but Hugo Boss is struggling because they're synonymous for smart clothing and suits. You know, back in the day, if you're talking 20 years ago and you had a Hugo Boss suit, hey, you're doing well. Now, I mean, who buys a suit anymore? Yeah, it's true. And I suppose coming back to the collabs, that's where these companies want to work with other companies like you said to produce that uh, gear for kind of a wide audience to wear now yeah. well i think especially when it's if, yeah, sakai i think is a great example um yeah i'll take the opportunity because you know that's 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 your shoe i mean you know that's a to me that's a great example of of, a, of, of what a collab should be again it, it's it changed up the silhouette enough to make it look like a new shoe yeah um, Colours notwithstanding, I think it was a really, really good shout um, that Josh made earlier in terms of how many colourways they're just going to keep pushing out of it. Because my concern is that when you've got something that really works, it feels a little bit like what Nike did with Jordans, uh, with J1s, and now doing with Dunks. Where oh, that everyone likes that, right? We're just going to absolutely, we're going to get as many models in as many colourways as we can in a short period of time. We're going to hype it up. And it felt a little bit like that's what happened with these guys. Agreed. I thought the nylon ones were a bit of a, well, we don't really know what to do. We haven't got anything too clever. Uh, let's do a white one and a black one with this material on. Uh, with, some, yeah. with some um, some laces made out of silk that everyone wanted to swap out as soon as they got them. Ballerina. Yeah. yeah, I took, I, <laughs> yeah I, took exactly. them I took them straight out and relaced them. Yeah, it's probably the most so, I'm doing, right? I mean, you try and tie it. It was horrible. Yeah. And you had this tiny little... Weird string, string yeah. lace, and it was like, what was that all about? <laughs> like somebody like, get rid of it all and have a really crappy lanyard. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but, that, but that's but what I, but it's interesting, you know, the way companies work with it. But what I was actually interested and wanted to discuss a bit about is um, take Palace and Supreme, right? They are probably the masters. Um, Josh has had to go, ladies and gentlemen. So um, we are going to carry on the three of us. Sorry about that. Um, he had to go to a meeting. So apologies. He will be back with us next week. So guys, it's just the three of us, which is absolutely cool. So what we're going to discuss, what we're going to discuss right now is we are going to talk about Palace and Supreme, as I was saying. For me, Palace and Supreme have are the king of kind of collaborators, right? Like week in, week out, you're seeing the collabs. What you're seeing is, is it's the, every season, you know it's their usual collabs and you're going to see, and then the surprise collabs, right? So you don't know who it's going to be. My problem is, and I feel like, you know, following Supreme and Palace for the last four or five years now, I just see it's all going, I don't know, I feel like it's all a bit too much maybe. And the, the collabs are becoming lazy. Like, you know, take the last two, three years of North Face and Supreme, and it's just been all a bit pants. It's not been that great. Oh. I think as well as that, when you look at something like North Face did with Gucci. Yes. Now, I don't think that that was a massively creative collaboration. Yeah. But it was so different and something that hadn't been done before. There was a massive amount of excitement for it. So it almost feels a little bit like, actually, if, if you're now wanting to want a Supreme North Face, that's because you didn't get a Gucci North Face. Yeah. You know, that's kind of how it feels. Um, and I think that there's an element where they've only got themselves to blame. I, I, I think... Um, some of the shoes that they've done um, in terms of collaboration have been absolutely shocking. I think the Air Force One, if you like an Air Force One, great. But again, talk about lazy collabs. <laughs> Add some laces on it and a tiny little bogo on the hill count on the hill cut. They did the dunks as well, didn't they? They did like a half and half. It almost looked like that was sort yep. of like a satin. It was like a red and white, wasn't it? Yeah, you know, this is white, your prime gold, example. Gold and blue. 
And yeah, red and white and a golden blue. Yeah, you're right, Andy. But the Air Forces is the prime example. Yeah. Like, like really, like I can't, look from one point. I understand it because it's just classic with a classic box logo on it. But from a consumer's view, you're paying a hundred odd quid for a shoe. You want something a little bit more, right? Yeah. yeah. But, I, I, but again, I, who is who? Supreme's market. You know, generally well, speaking, it's probably well, not yeah, that's us the... set on this call. We're, we're, you know, I don't mind buying those stuff, but we're not their core demographic. Far from it. I, I mean, know. If, you're if, if you're if you're 15, 16, 17 at school, and you turn up rocking a pair of you know Uptown Supremes, um, Air Force One Supremes. Yeah, you're, you're the, the king of the playground. Yeah, playground you're the you know? Exactly, um, totally. And I think that's what you'll see people like Josh buying it where if they can buying up yeah. multiple pairs because it will be those kids that will probably get mum and dad to pay for them. I, you know, I think there's still, of course, there's still people a bit older. Yeah, um, of course. But, but you're right. What is their demographic now? Look, yeah. I reckon that, look, 10 years ago, you knew the demographic. It was, you know, a typical, what, 17-year-old kid, right? Yeah. But now, because it's exactly. so mainstream, but it's anybody. It as well, though, Jamie, I, you know, I think, bearing in mind, you know, that, that's a company that started in, what, 94? Yeah. You would think that a company that, you know, some of the stuff they do is pretty out there, but at the end of the day, a lot of it is, you know, graphic tees. You know, that's what I wear to work every day. Yeah. And I've known the brand, well, not since 94. I'm not going to say that, oh, I've been supreme since day, day one because I haven't. But, you know, that's the company I've known since probably around about the 2000s. So you feel like you've kind of grown and maybe we, and with their core demographic, but there's certainly plenty of people my sort of age that would still definitely be looking to buy. The problem is some of the Larry stuff, I wouldn't go near. Um, and some of the stuff that I do want, I know I'll never get, so I don't bother. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're, they're, For as long as they sell it, I, I don't know. They're at, a very I hear that. Cross, they're at a very interesting crossover as well. As you know, before Christmas, that uh, Vanity Fair, VF Corporation, uh, who owned Timberland, who owned the North Face, paid £1.5 billion pounds yeah. To buy the Supreme, uh, so the, the the key is how do you va- how do you value a, um, a brand that people could drop straight away? Um, it's a brand that you had existing collaborations with because obviously, um, as I say, there's been Timberland, there's been a lot of North Face as we've already been discussing. Um, but what VF Corp are trying to do is they want to. We're seeing a lot of as as we've gone through this difficult period of last year with COVID, a lot of businesses are retooling and working out how they can hunker down, take advantage of whether it's cheap finance, being able to buy distressed assets. As we've seen Arcadia going bust. Um, you know, we've seen Debenhams going, but you know, you've seen all this stuff that people can cherry pick all the, all the, all the good bits. Um, but what a lot of the deals are doing at the moment, and it's like JD when they bought Shoe Palace and JD when they bought... Um, Finish down, Line. Down, downtown, well, Finish Line before, but Downtown yeah. Locker Room, which they bought... Um, Recently, yeah. yeah. Um, they are picking up a they're picking up a bolt on, but they're wanting to leave it kind of as it is. They don't want to transform it totally. But what but what the F Corp want to do is they want to be able to branch it out into different regions and they want to be able to change how so if you look at wholesale, if you look at wholesale versus DTC, um, you know, Supreme stuff is sold either online or in a Supreme store or yeah, but ha- sorry to interrupt, but no, no. S- sorry to interrupt, Andy. I totally agree. But supreme simple is supply and demand, right? Yeah. You know that's their that's their key to success. But and now they- what you're saying is they're going to want to have normal shops and shopping centres, supreme shops. No, I don't think I don't think well that they they will. What I think they'll be able to do is they can either grow things geographically to other regions more. They can push, yeah, it, um, or they can. Uh, and they can they can do more sort of online stuff at the moment it does feel a little bit raw doesn't it going on to supreme and checking out it all feels a little bit like it's a beta development sort of it all feels very very <laughs> very very raw yeah. uh, no it's not a nice consume, consumer experience the danger with that is are you going to be able to, are you now going to start to look to create more product and then are you going to have the hype stuff and this is a, this has been a, a, a something that you you could say that maybe easy could have done should have done is have stuff that is on the shelf and able to get and then you have stuff that sells out very quickly i think maybe adidas with ivy park should have um some stuff that you can go in buy some fitness yoga stuff with ivy park on it um 
and but also have stuff that they drop once every once a year twice a year that yeah, sells out limited that keeps that hype and it's getting that balance um and and um we saw the same with Montclair buying Stone Island. I mean, they're two very, very different brands. One is from a, a football terrace culture, and one is from the uh, the, the, the the mountains. Uh, you know, in Italy, uh, we know Stone Island came from sort of military wear, uh, so it's all very, very different. But again, we're going back to that blurring of the lines, and maybe Virgil Abloh's helped it with regards to being men's chief men's designer at LVMH or Louis Vuitton um, but having that streetwear background to it uh, and it's that blurring of the lines that they know that if you're a Montclair and you, you you've got these six seven eight hundred pound coats that you're selling you're always going to have a recession proof audience that you can sell to but actually yeah. what do people want what do they want to be able to get and, 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 and they're looking at whether it is nice little collaborations or actually being able to the more day-to-day -day stuff that they're as opposed to just high-end luxury well that's a good point because you forget about the high-end stuff we've spoken about you know the palace and the sneakers and the supreme but you're right the high-end collaborations is actually quite a big thing now and you're i suppose proven. they're doing that to entice that customer to keep that customer on track well again i think for, for me i think you know coming back to the sakai's i think some of the great things about a decent collab is it will switch you onto a brand that you'd never heard of. I'd, yeah. I'd be the first to admit, I've not heard of Sakai before I same. bought these. Yeah, um, same. But now, obviously, when you're browsing and you want to have a look and you, you wanted to treat yourself to something nice, then it is a brand that when I go through a filter on a website, actually includes yeah. Sakai. I don't want to see what there is. Um, I think it depends. I mean, coming back to the Montclair Sony piece, that's a really good shout because is it still a collab if it's essentially two brands under the same umbrella or actually is it just dual branded you, do you know what i mean i wonder yeah. I wonder where collabs are going in that space when you've got these companies getting bought up in yeah. terms of will you still call it a, a, a north face supreme collab or is it just a dual branded I, I think what's most interesting on that and you can go away from montclair and stone iron for a moment and look at vf corp um, and supreme yes the north face supreme have been collabs that they bring out once or twice a year i wonder if they will and, and they've hinted the ceo of vf corp hinted that he would leave supreme kind of as it is but there's already rumors circulating that some supreme collabs are being pulled because there's a conflict there so fine you might want to do your you might want to do your uh, your north face collaboration because you own both brands or maybe some timberland stuff but do you suddenly want them to do a collaboration with a competitor a competitor's mm. label um, you know, and if we're looking from this whole luxury stuff, you know, you have, you have fashion houses, so Caring, for instance, um, who I'm pretty sure own Balenciaga, they own lots of very uh, well-known fashion brands, and they do keep them under the a bigger umbrella. Um, so you have a you have fashion houses that own, so they, they can let them run individually, um, but there is, like I say, there is a blurring of the lines. Amazing interesting um all right andy what show have you got by the way i'm gonna do two go i'm on. gonna do one for leon go on do one for leon <laughs> i'm gonna do leon i'm gonna do leon's one first go on do leon's um, one i haven't asked him by this but by the way but so it's all right this is a three-way collaboration and i think that particularly one of the people involved one of the brands involved in this collaboration have done some amazing collaborations in the last well they do generally they do but, but particularly in 2020 so this is um this is the adidas campus so this was a collaboration with fox brothers who are a suit maker oh wow so going back to what we were saying about how we don't wear suits anymore well yeah these are actually like wool at different panels but also the orange is on there and it's uh with sides as well so this, ah. is a, this is a collaboration, a three-way with uh, Adidas, Fox Brothers, and Size. And you cannot deny that Size have absolutely smashed the ball out of the park with some of their collaborations um, this year. So for me, it's, it's, it's not one that is widely sort of owned, I don't think, but it was one for me having, working in the city, uh, or used to, um, I work from home now, 
uh, it kind of ticked quite a few boxes because like I say, you can probably see with the paneling, there's actually three different types of- That is beautiful, of, to be fair. Um, yeah. Really, so really I've, nice. Yeah, I've got to say, I'm not, what is it, a superstar? That's a campus. No, a campus, sorry. I was going to say, it's not a model that I'm kind of that familiar with or own, but I could, the execution on it is incredible. Yeah, um, like, really it's, nice. it's like, a, what, you've got a pinstripe on there, there's, there's like a, a tartan a chalk or something. Stripe, a chalk stripe, there's just like a charcoal gray. And then there's, is that a Prince of Wales? I'm not sure what they call That's it. That's beautiful. The, yeah, the quality looks insane. Yeah, it's not one you'd ever wear when there's wet around, but I mean, anyway, okay. Um, and my collaboration, my choice, and you say, this will be lots of people's one, but I have, to, I have to do this because for me, the execution of this was just unreal. And for anyone, and I'm sure a lot of people have had these in hand. Have you have you got a pair, you two? No, I don't have a pair. No, I've not, I've not seen them in hand either. No, I don't. I've, I've seen a lot of pictures. Them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you got a you got a uh, mustard you got gravy laces or mustard laces. Um, there was the friends and family box that came because it was done around Thanksgiving, etc. Yeah. Again, I don't know if that will show up, but there's um, no, it's not going to show up. But you've got really, really soft leather inside got concepts written on it and up close there it's basically like a plastic but they've basically sliced into it you've got the blue and the green for the mallard um you know you've got the different uh panels and materials and this is really really soft so this for me is fantastic but concepts as a whole they are, you know, if you if you were to look up lazy collab, they're the opposite end of the of the spectrum. Because <laughs> uh, I mean, if, with their packaging, if you think back to the uh, the lobsters and with the boxes of like the ice boxes and stuff like that, it's just, I mean, I'd love to have a pair of, um, I'd love to have a pair of the uh, of the lobsters, but yeah, well, that's yeah, I, that's actually a good point because talk about SB. I, I feel kind of they are the silhouette <laughs> that Nike basically says, go out and be free. Yeah. Do you know it's what I mean? Fun, like, be free. Collaboration. It's a do fun, what you yeah. want. Go and collaborate with who you want, how you want, whatever colour. Like you've looked at the SPs. Look at the Chunky Dunkies. You know, they've never put that no. style on any other model, right? No. Um, exactly. And it suits the SB. And I think that that's a great thing what SB do is they do go out and they find these amazing stores around the world and they come out with these incredible collaborations. And like you said, the packaging, some of the friends and family boxes, it's actually better than the shoe sometimes. Yeah, it's <laughs> the whole part of the whole package, as you say. And yeah. Back when it started in 2002 and Sandy Bodecker was given a bit of a free reign to go off and, you know, just go and sit and meet with skateboarders and just get and that's when you have a, a, a deep trust of your uh, of your customer that loves your brand. And that's why a Montclair, a VF Corp, all these people, they have to be careful who they're coming in and purchasing because you have to protect that sort of, that, those relationships. It's like the JD stuff, the, the, the acquisitions, and again, I've been saying DLTR um, is East Coast. They're entrenched with the communities there. Shoe Palace is West Coast, Latinx, um, you know, JD Sports weren't huge with Latinx um, customers. Well, Shoe Palaces, they bought Shoe Palace. They want to keep it. They want to be able to be entrenched with the communities because that's what all of them are talking about, whether it's the brands and the manufacturers or the retailers, is we need to be able to appeal to the community. Of course, because they need to keep the sales up. Yeah, exactly. They're dropping so many shoes. <laughs> so we've been going nearly about 40 odd minutes, which has been really good considering it's been a little bit of a uh, tipsy topsy version of uh, the round table today, but we've held it together, which is good. Thank I'm going to finish, I'm going to finish off with my <clears throat> shoe. Um, but before I do, I want to talk a little bit what we just discussed about boxes and presentation. Where I said some guys and some of these um, collabs and some of these skate stores and whatnot do some amazing boxes, there's the reverse where how many times they bring a shoe out and the box is just the normal box. Yeah. And it just infuriates me where they could just <clears throat> do something, you know? Yeah. And it doesn't always have to be over the top. But for me, I like a box with a collab shoe sometimes. It makes yeah, it a bit more uh, special. Um completely not fussed about a box i mean in fair obviously 
my age, married, two kids. In fact, yeah, all, all of my shoes are in their boxes, but it's all stuck in a cupboard. There's yeah, no, no, I get that. No, nothing's on display. So in fairness, they're literally, if anything, they're an annoyance because to get one particular pair out seems to take forever. Yeah, you've got to find um, them. But I leave them in there just because otherwise the, the shoes would probably get ruined. But it's just, it's, it's a function over form for me, not form over function with a box. It's, mm. I mean, some of them look really cool. If I'd have got, if I'd have won a pair of Chunky Donkeys in a friends and family box, I don't know what the yeah. hell I would have done with that box because it just well, would have. You would have displayed it behind. It would be displayed behind you. <laughs> no, I've only brought these up here because they're the shoes that I brought up to, in case we wanted to talk about other collabs. So these are usually in cupboards. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think for a classic one would be the Adidas Lego ZX. I mean, how how simple would it have been to just mess around with the box to give it a bit more of a Lego feel to it? Yeah, I agree. Because you saw the friends and family, which I think Sean got, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, exactly. I yeah. mean, you know, and I'm not exactly. Wasn't that made out of actual bricks and stuff? Where you something like that? Yeah, but you're right. So, just yeah. certain things, I'd like stick, just stick throwing a, a bag of Lego on, or something, or, or just stick a fiver on the price of it and have like uh, a big Duke Pro box lid or something made yeah. out of plastic. You know, just because it's just fun. Yeah, I, I agree mean, with you. Uh, a Lego shoe has to be fun, surely. It's bloody multicolored, and you know. Uh, so talking of boxes and my shoe. Oi, oi. <laughs> we started the, the show on him. We finished the edition. show on him. Yeah, this uh, for me is a very special show. Have you um, even worn those, Jamie? They look absolutely mint. Are you out? God, they're looking wow. amazing, Nick. Blimey. I'll be honest with you. This shoe was one of my first shoes of my kind of hype collab you know, like five odd years ago when I kind of started getting back into the community and back into kind of, you know, the uh, Instagram and whatnot. And I managed to have a very lucky first, no, it wasn't my first actually, but it was one of my early wins with Offspring. Wow. So shout out Offspring. And I don't know, there's just something about this every time I look at it. And I have worn it, as you can see, you know, I have worn it. <laughs> the proof is there. But yeah, I've looked after it and I've cleaned it and I just kind of will cherish this shoe. Yeah. It's amazing. I just think what he did with it was incredible. And one of the biggest things what I actually love, and it's funny because I didn't at the beginning, but now I appreciate it more. I like actually that he's not with Nike anymore. So it was the one ever shoe that he did, and there will never be another one. Where I was going back to sometimes where like, don't get me wrong, I love Sakai, and I've got a couple of pairs myself, but like, are we now going to see four pairs of Sakai every year now for the next 10, 15 years? Because for me, I think you just kind of then lose that kind of excitement, you know? Well, Sakai yeah. should maybe do something with Deodora or something like that. I mean, I, I think Deodora nailed their, um, their collabs well. I mean, I've got I've got a, a bit of a, well, I'm not, I'm not going to say I love the Deodora because I don't have many pairs, but one of my first memories is when I was in junior school was there was a kid that had this pair of basic Deodoras and I've got a pair there. <laughs> Um, but yeah, some companies are doing some fantastic collabs. Amazing. The material. One that stands out for me, sorry. All the materials and stuff that I use, I think it's, it's, they're never, because they don't do so many collaborations, they're never accused of being lazy. With it. Yeah. One of the ones that stands out for me, which I don't own, but a friend of mine, he's massively, massively into his ASICs. And did you remember the Montclair ASICs collab? Uh, I don't off the top of my head, actually, no. But They um, did it I, in a absolutely. cream, they did it in a cream and a navy. And the whole of the inside was like a uh, fur, you oh, know, like a wool kind of fur, the whole shoe. Yeah. Uh, it was just really put together. Yeah. Alex, you got anything else you want to uh, leave yeah, us Yeah, I was with? just going to say, I think with the, with the Wotherspoons, I think an interesting video. So I had those shoes. Yeah. Paid resale for them. Um, had them. Didn't like them. Didn't like wearing them. Um, so then sold them for less than I paid for. Made a 200 quid loss on them after... God knows, you know, I think I only had him for about two, three months. But I found the inner sole because it's like a, it's like a velvet sort of felt. I found that oh, really slippy. Oh, I found yes. it really strange to walk in. Um, obviously, I went through to size, so they came up a little big anyway, so they're quite difficult to walk in. And I think back to Josh's point um, that he made earlier as well, because I could be completely wrong, but didn't people vote for his design to win? So I think the piece that Josh mentioned earlier, I totally get that obviously brands have stuck with him, i.e. Um, Adidas. 
look, for me, I think that's more off the back of the success of the uh, 97. Yeah. Than it is because he's a reseller. And, 100%. And I think, you know, Nike didn't collab with him regardless of that. Actually, they collab with him because he won the most the amount competition. of competition. Have yeah. that shoe go had into had production. Followers. He had most followers, um, I think. Was yeah. Like, yeah. Well. Was tough. Yeah. I mean, and I, but I think the most, fantastic no, you're right. But, but the most followers was because of the uh, round two following. Exactly. Yeah. But interestingly, as well, how much of what he did with that '97 um, is down to he was working on a pretty decent silhouette to start with. Because I'm sorry, when you look at what he's done with the ZX or the Superstars, uh, no, I agree. I agree. I don't own them. That is not the the one at all. The only the only other one I'd have if I could get them, I would have the Asics because I because it goes back to the corduroy and I love all the taking the stuff off. Yeah. Uh, But I agree with you. I don't own any of the Adidas ones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That that's all I was going to say on the on the ninety seven ones. I say lovely shoe, but they just they they weren't for me. Brilliant. Brilliant. I've got one thing, but I'm going to put it it. very very quickly because I'm running out of time. Uh, give me um, one of your your favourite collab and the worst collab. Go, Jamie. Oh, God. Favourite and worst. All right, I'm going to go straight out there. Chunky Dunky recent times for me. I don't own it. I want to own it. For me, it's just everything a collab should be. Yeah. Um, worst yeah. collab recently. Oof. I'm going to move over to Alex. Let me have a think on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a um, hard one now. You put me on the spot. So, best collab recently for me personally, and obviously bearing in mind it's quite subjective, um, is... Yeah. These, um, I like all three of the J1s that Off-White did. Um, probably pulled me back into loving Jordans again. Um, again, as much as it's quite subtle... There's quite a lot of changes in the panelling and the materials, which I think make it a good collab. Worst one recently for me, um, funnily enough, I think it was one that someone posted up on the panel on their Facebook group today, and that was the Sean Wetherspoon ZX. Um, I think that is a horrendous looking shoe. I think it is, you know, the tassel stuff. I don't know whether he means to keep it similar to the Superstar, but for something that already looked horrible, to put it onto something to make it look even worse is actually quite a skill, and he's, he's done that brilliantly. So... <laughs> That's, yeah. For me, that's the worst one recently. We're going to finish off and I'm going to agree with you. The only thing that I will say in his defence, only because of some YouTube videos I've watched, I believe the tassels is all about his creativity to the consumer. Like, keep them on, take them off, tie them up. Anyway, Flat them. whatever. <laughs> I'm, whatever. Going say, I'm going to say one thing. Go on. Lab, anything to do with crops, don't do it. <laughs> but people love it. They sell out. For goodness sake. But I don't own a pair, but they're meant to be super comfortable, apparently, around the house. Well, apparently Nike created this week the first ever uh, shoe that you don't have to touch. The oh, Crocs, that, yeah. The Crocs We're going to talk me. about that. Yeah. Crocs, Crocs must be being like, uh, where have you been for the last 20 years? I want that yeah. shoe, by the way. <laughs> of course you do. I want that shoe. I think it looks great. I just, I just have visions of running behind a, someone when you're at school or something, running around and behind them in the playground and treading on their ankle, treading on, <laughs> treading on their heel, and then their shoe comes off. Just, just a little clip. And just remember, Brilliant. Jamie, you're pointing to the, how comfortable Crocs are. Comfort is never worth your dignity. Just, just no. remember that. Okay. I don't own a pair. I will never own a pair. Lies, lies. Hundred percent. It. It's all about slides around the house. Justin, on that note, Justin Bieber loves them. He did a collaboration with them. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Funny <laughs> enough, l- last thing about Crocs, the mad thing is they are collaborating with everyone at the moment. They are. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, the, the one that I think is funkiest is the, that they did like a KFC one with a uh, fried chicken. Yeah, that looked great, but and, I'm still yeah, not going down that route. No. No, no. definitely <laughs> not going down that route. Unless I get seeded a pair. <laughs> Crocs, I don't think of what shout we've out. I don't, yeah. I don't think of the Crocs. <laughs> Uh, guys it's been amazing thank you very much ladies and gentlemen for staying with us and watching another episode of the round table with full frame kicks uh alex thank you for coming on being an amazing thank guest you. as always love you loads andy great co-host thank you apologies yeah. about josh he had to run off to a meeting leon apologies in his absence he will be back hopefully next week with us we will come back with another topic 
and another episode of the round table with full frame kicks do not forget to like subscribe and comment notifications we will see you soon i've been jd hicks and he has been the sneak economist the sneaker dog and alex has been i've been myself um and uh, at dean 76 on insta excellent peace out everyone <laughs>